lovely evening. It's very great to have you all again this evening. My name is Dr. Michael Shane Powers. I'm a history professor here at Angelo State. And I'd like you well, to welcome you all specifically to the very first of we, what we hope to be annual Lone Star Lecture Series. Um, we hope to do this lecture series each year in early March to largely correspond, of course, with the anniversary of Texas Independence on March 2nd. So our very first Lone Star Lecture Series will feature Dr. Donald S. Frazier. He is the director of the Texas Center at Shriner University in Kerrville, graduate of the University of Texas at Arlington and Texas Christian. Frazier is the award-winning author of six books on the Civil War, one of which we'll be talking about tonight. Dr. Frazier has taught at Texas Christian, McMurray, and Shriner. He's also very involved in public history, working on Civil War and frontier heritage trails in Texas, New Mexico, and Louisiana. He's helped design uh, Frontier Texas, a museum attraction in Abilene, and he's the writer and director of a video, Our Home, Our Rights, Texas and Texans in the Civil War, which won the Mitchell Wilder Award for Excellence in Publications and Media Design from the Texas Association of Museums. Finally, Dr. Frazier is an elected member of the Philosophical Society of Texas, a fellow for the Texas State Historical Association, and is on the Texas Historical <laughs> Foundation. He's also an advisor to the Alamo, the State Board of Education, and Governor Greg Abbott has recently appointed him to be uh, an advisor for the Texas 1836 Project. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Frazier. Thank you. Thank you. to project into the back of the room and uh, be able to walk around a little bit. So this is actually the uh, culmination of a long process of research that I engaged in uh, starting back in graduate school at TCU, as you heard. And uh, I got fascinated by the idea of what did Texas do in the Civil War? You know, Civil War is kind of a big deal and it has all sorts of different uh, ramifications for American history. So what ends up happening in Texas during all that? You probably need me behind the uh, behind the podium for your camera, huh? All right, I'll put one. I'll put my Okay. All right. I'm trying to be a good citizen here. Um, so the uh, the question becomes: What did Texas do in the Civil War? And it turns out it did a lot of stuff, but most of what it did was in Louisiana. And that's what led me to start prowling the bayous of that state. Uh, ended up with a series of books called the Louisiana Quadrille, and this is actually an overview of my most recent work, which came out in 2020. So one thing that you need to think about when it comes to Texas in the Civil War is it's trans-Mississippi. So the control of the Mississippi River is really setting the uh, trajectory of how Texas participates in that great national conflict. And one of the things that people forget about is that there's a lot of soldiers that get collected on the Mississippi River during the Vicksburg and Fort Hudson campaign. So the United States has a big chunk of its military power concentrated in a very tight area on the lower Mississippi. So what becomes of these troops? Where do they go? What do they do? Uh, the commanders there, Ulysses Grant and Nathaniel P. Banks, both said, hey, this is a layup. What we need to do is we need to now leave the Mississippi behind and we need to go east. And what we'll do is we'll coordinate with other Union armies that are moving out of Tennessee and we'll come in on Atlanta from the southwest while they come in on Atlanta from the north. It's a pincher action. If you guys have seen any of the recent maps from what's going on elsewhere in the world, you'll understand what pincher actions look like. This was the plan. But what they end up getting told to do is actually best represented by these solid lines. They get told to push west and finish off the Trans-Mississippi. 
Trans-Mississippi is a big, big place. And if you really think about it as the whole, it goes from Missouri all the way down to the Rio Grande, all the way west, technically to the border with California. But the real important part of the Trans-Mississippi is this region right here. So why did the federal government think it was so important to finish off the Trans-Mississippi? It's, there's a number of reasons, but primarily it's political. We want to take these states out and away from the Confederacy, and we want to reconstruct them so that they then become places that can help ratify the 13th Amendment. What's the 13th Amendment do? It abolishes slavery. The Lincoln administration has correctly identified that slavery's got to be absolutely abolished at the national level. The Emancipation Proclamation is fine and dandy, but it doesn't really do much other than become part of the scaffolding for dismantling the entire system of slavery. The only way you're going to dismantle it forever is if there's a constitutional amendment. One of the biggest fears that people had in the Northern administration amongst abolitionists and in the North in general was that what if the states surrender? What if the Confederacy collapses too fast? What do you do with slavery then? Because you don't have a 13th Amendment in place. Will Louisiana come back into the Union as a slave state? Will all these states that were in the Confederacy, if they decided to say, no, just kidding, we all want to come back and kiss and make up? Essentially, all their institutions are intact. And slavery is a state prerogative because of the various things that had gone on in the decades before. So you got to kill slavery. The only way you kill slavery is by making it illegal as the law of the land. The only way you're going to get that done is by constitutional amendment. So you got to get some more states in on that action. So the Trans-Mississippi seems like an easy place to harvest votes for that movement. So what ends up happening is the great campaign to finish off the Trans-Mississippi. And it will be a coordinated effort between Ulysses Grant's army from Vicksburg and Nathaniel P. Banks' army from Port Hudson in Louisiana. So you can see from this sort of detailed chart here how they're going to essentially send multiple prongs, multiple columns into the Trans-Mississippi and finish off Confederate resistance there. By and large, this will be Arkansas and, and Louisiana in its focus. But there's also this element of Texas involved. The move against Texas will essentially be an amphibious operation that will cut off that lower road. As you can see, there's a lot of different ways to get to Louisiana from Texas. And Texas will end up feeding the Confederate efforts in Louisiana and reinforcing the Confederate efforts in Louisiana. So Banks says, look, what we need to do, we're now really looking at most of Banks' operation in the south, and Grant is up here in the north, Banks says, we'll drop in some troops, a blocking force there at Sabine Pass. We'll take the town of Beaumont, and we will cut off, we'll essentially block any reinforcements and weapons coming into Louisiana from that direction. Other than that, it's all push east to west with that blocking force in place. That's the grand plan. Bottle them up in East Texas. Destroy the rebel army. It's already not had a great showing, so they figure, how tough can it be to wipe these guys out? Reconstruct Louisiana and Arkansas for sure, just like I mentioned, but also to capture the center of gravity, the military <coughs> and political center of gravity in the Trans-Mississippi. Now, there's a difference of opinion here. Nathaniel P. Banks says the most important city in the Trans-Mississippi is Houston. You take Houston, the rest of it collapses. The general in chief of the army, the advisor to Abraham Lincoln, says, no, it's Shreveport. If you take Shreveport, which is the military headquarters of the Confederate effort in the Trans-Mississippi, everything will fall apart. 
bank says, you're wrong, I'm right, I'm going to Houston. Somebody else can take Shreveport. Either way, if you remember back to that earlier math, they're going to take both towns before it's all done. But I want to bring your attention to this next to last bullet point. Plant the flag in Texas to discourage the French. All right? That's a new one. Where'd this French story come from? Well, the French are driving this whole thing, and not everybody realizes it. Last is reconstruct Texas. Bring it in as well. Now let's talk about the French. You guys have probably heard of the Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo was an event that occurred on the 5th of May, 1862, at the town of Puebla. The French have invaded Mexico under the pretense that they're going to essentially collect foreign debts owed to them, but they're actually intervening in a Mexican Civil War, uh, the after effects of La Guerra de la Reforma, the Reform War of the late 1850s. And the French are essentially sticking their nose in it and trying to exploit it. And one of the things that they would really like to see happen in Mexico is to create a cotton producing region that could keep their cotton mills running, especially those around the city of Nimes in the south of France, where they produce a cloth called cloth de Nimes, or denim, right? So these guys are worried about blue jeans. <laughs> but what ends up happening is that the Mexicans put up a much better resistance. Ignacio Zaragoza, Texas born, Goliad boy, uh, is actually in charge of the Mexican forces at that battle, and they stopped the French invasion. Now, what else is going on around the 5th of May? Well, there's a lot of stuff going on in the American Civil War. The United States is very, very distracted. By and large, the United States wouldn't be able to react. If the French had been able to pull off a victory and take Mexico City by June of 1862, they would have had plenty of time to set up their puppet state before the United States could catch its breath and react. Because remember, the Rebs are kind of doing their job in the summer of 1862. They're whipping federal forces. The defeat at Puebla of the French column sets their timetable back a year. And what a difference a year makes. So now all of a sudden it's the summer of 63 the Confederacy has lost the Mississippi, it's all beat up, and the Union can now react to French threats. The French came back after the Battle of Puebla, they captured Mexico City, they said, here we are. Now we're ready to start things, but the United States is in a different position than they were the year before. So the French do a little power projection. Look at this awesome warship. That is the, uh, essentially the sister ship of the, of the Normandy. The Normandy is a ironclad frigate that the French send over to the Gulf of Mexico. This is state-of-the-art power projection. It's essentially like putting an aircraft carrier group in the Persian Gulf or the South China Sea today. Why would they need an ironclad frigate to go against Mexico's Navy? Because Mexico's Navy is by and large on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. So you don't need a ship like that to challenge the Mexican Navy. You need a ship like that to challenge the American Navy. And that's what's going on in the Western Gulf. Here's how it all went down. So the liberals under Benito Juarez had won the War of the Reform. The losers, the conservatives, didn't like that verdict. They said, we actually need an even stronger central government than we had been asking for in the past. We need to go find a monarch to come over here and essentially set up a kingdom that will then be a client state of France. Um, the U.S. sides with Juarez and the C.S. sides with France. So that's kind of the background noise to these campaigns going on in the Trans-Mississippi. There's other practical considerations, military goals, that the federal war planners want to achieve by this multi-pronged invasion 
west of the Mississippi. We talked about it. Clear that west bank of the Mississippi. You know, the Confederates had a very annoying habit of shooting at boats going by. <laughs> and that makes it really close inside the pilot house of a Mississippi River steamer when there's many balls rattling around in there. Or even worse, a six pounder around go, you know, dancing through the woodwork. So they said, look, we gotta control both sides of the river. We can't just take the east side and leave the west side on its own. So let's clear the west bank. We need those electoral votes as well so we can make sure that Lincoln gets reelected. We need the 13th Amendment, talked about that. And while we're at it, can we set up Galveston as a United States enclave on the Gulf of Mexico before the French do? Because the Confederates are actively romancing French intervention. They would love the French to throw in on their side. Remarkably, this is the first time in American history that a republic is willing to surrender its political interest to a monarchy. Essentially going upstream from the American Revolution, which is something that kind of strikes me as icky. The, the Confederates are willing to do anything to win. Uh, and what you have now in the Trans-Mississippi is a rump confederacy. So what could possibly go wrong? I mean, my gosh, you've got 100,000 troops to do it, but it's a complicated operation. And the Trans-Mississippi is still a frontier. It's a wilderness. There's not good roads. The rivers are real persnickety. Uh, that's a technical term. <laughs> you never know when they're gonna rise, when they're gonna fall. Uh, there's huge distances. The, the Confederates are pretty sneaky. As they say, the enemy gets a boat, and the Confederates already have their boats lined up. There's another issue. The Lincoln administration says, while you're doing all this, would you mind raising 100,000 African-American soldiers from the newly emancipated population to form essentially an army of occupation? So the military commanders are going, ah, let me get this ready. Right. You got it done. Nah, nah, nah. Oh, yeah, the French. Nah, nah, nah. And the French. They're going, man, you're not asking for much. There's another thing that kind of complicates this very complicated effort. The Trans Mississippi may be cut off from the rest of the Confederacy, but it's not operating in a vacuum. Now, the preliminary scouting looks promising. Things are looking good. They send some scouting expeditions, some reconnaissance and force operations from places like Vicksburg, from places like Helena, out from Natchez. You can see the map here where all they're going. The Confederates make a meager effort to kind of push back, but they're not very effective at staying this offensive. They know. The Confederates say, look, if they do what we think they're going to do, we are royally hosed. And this is going to be a very short campaign. We can't resist it. The hero of this sort of counterpunch is Tom Green, namesake of your very own county. And Green's really good at reconnaissance and figuring out what's coming down the road and reporting it back. And his uh, informed decision is we're hosed. Right. <laughs> so this will be the next thing that needs to happen and happen well, and that's the amphibious operation on the coast of Texas, barely on the coast of Texas. I mean, the East Bank's Mississippi or uh, Louisiana. The operation from Natchez goes in, clears out the Confederate resistance. That goes well. So early September, all signs are positive. But there's some other things that aren't so positive. In order to coordinate these efforts, Ulysses Grant leaves his headquarters at Vicksburg and goes down to New Orleans. And while there, he is confabbing with Nathaniel P. Banks, and they're going to go review the Army, which is in camp at Camp Carrollton, which is now the Audubon Zoo. So if you're ever in New Orleans, go to the Audubon Zoo, all those great big oak trees and stuff. There used to be about 20,000 Union troops camped there. So when Grant and Banks go over there to check out the Army, 
you know, Grant didn't travel with his horse, so Frank says, well, I've got one. You can borrow mine. Great. So he's on a borrowed horse, poking around, and they have a three or five or 17 martini lunch <laughs> in New Orleans when it's hot. I don't know if y'all know this, but Grant had a reputation for drinking good sense. Okay. So now he's kind of a little unsteady in the saddle, and one of the aides from Banks' of staff says, you know, well, we're going back to the headquarters of the St. Charles Hotel, race you. <laughs> and Grant says, who's got a great reputation as a horseman, says, fine, you're on. And they're doing a horse race from Camp Carrollton back to the St. Charles Hotel while drunk. Or certainly tips. The horse falls out from under them. Horse falls out because they come around the corner, there's a locomotive there, a lot of different stories. But the horse lands right on top of Grant and nearly kills him in the streets of New Orleans. So I was giving this lecture in Louisiana. Somebody said, well, where did that happen? I said, well, you know, I, I have no idea. And this guy was a private investigator. And I said, you know, you know New Orleans, why don't you sort it out for me? He said, yes, it's very important for me to figure out where this happened because if I can find out where it happened, I want to put a monument there. I said, a monument to Grant's horse wreck? He says, yes, yeah, specifically to the horse. <laughs> Typical Louisiana. But Grant is nearly killed and his injury is covered up. I mean, there is a, a conspiracy to cover up and limit the news of this terrible event that's happened. So now Grant's out of the picture. Dang, that's not very good. Guess what? The amphibious operation against Texas is an absolute disaster. They have 5,000 troops are gonna put ashore. It's defended by 42 Houstonians with five big cannons. And the Houstonians win. They lose two Union gunboats. The transports are all breaking down out at sea. The amphibious operation fails. So now all of a sudden that blocking force is not going to be in position. Then there's a major military catastrophe that befalls Union arms in faraway Georgia. You know, this is essentially the Tet Offensive <laughs> of its day because it shocked everybody. The Battle of Chickamauga in North Georgia wasn't supposed to happen. The Confederates were losing. They'd lost the Mississippi. They'd lost Gettysburg. The Rebs were on the ropes. Well, they weren't nearly as dead as reported. And they nearly destroyed the entire Union Army in that fight, which then leads to panic in Washington, D.C. And all of those troops that are on the Mississippi are a very enticing target. But the troops operating in Louisiana don't know that yet. So the first thing they have to do is locate the bad guys, locate the Confederates. So if you haven't been to Louisiana, just imagine Louisiana as a Y, okay? That's the shape it's in. And that's all the stuff you can actually move up and down. Anything that's not in that Y is kind of swampy or dense woods or yick. Another technical term. So where that Y comes together is the town of Alexandria. And if you've ever gone through Louisiana, you know Alex, as the locals call it, it's a critical point of juncture. A buddy of mine from Thibodeau says, easy to remember. From Alex north, they butter their rice. From Alex south, it's dirty rice. <laughs> so Louisiana has this complicated physical geography, but also cultural geography. So the Federals are going, all right, how do we get into this very complicated physical geography and root the bad guys out? So they start poking around. Uh, all these maps are available in print form for your perusal because they may not make much sense from where you're standing other than I can point out we're coming from Baton Rouge, Port Hudson, and down here to a place called Morgan City, present-day Brashear City, Louisiana. This is essentially US 90 going up this direction. So the Federals are in the dark colors, the Confederates are in the gray colors. But you can see there's essentially one axis of advance this way and one axis of advance this direction. 
Okay? And if you can catch the Confederates between these two axes, axes of advance, then you'll be able to wipe them out. How far can the Confederates retreat? Well, all the way to Houston. Why can they retreat all the way to Houston? Because the blocking force didn't make it. So it's sort of like trying to pin down a flea. You're just not sure where this guy's going to hop to next. All right. More details. We're moving out of Vicksburg, but we're not moving out of Vicksburg into Louisiana. Look at that. They sent 24,000 troops over towards Chattanooga. Those guys are taken out of the fight before the campaign really gets started. And you can see those other listings. So pretty soon, the grand campaign in the Trans-Mississippi is down one major leader and most of its troops. They just don't have the troops to be as ambitious as they had hoped. Which means you have to start contracting your expectations. <laughs> so will they be able to destroy the Confederate Army in the Trans-Mississippi? Not likely, because we can't pin them down now. We can't block them, can't pin them down, can't overwhelm them. Can you reconstruct Louisiana and Arkansas? Probably. Can you capture Houston? Yes, but I can't capture Houston and Shreveport both. So I'm going for Houston, Shreveport can go high. Can you plant the flag in Texas? Yes, if we take Houston. Can we take Houston from the east? Well, not without fighting the Confederates the whole way, so that's going to be problematic. Can you reconstruct Texas? Perhaps. And accomplish whatever else you can. All right, so now Nathaniel P. Banks, pictured here, has to do more, do as much as he can with much fewer resources. So here's the plan. The French are on the move. So he says, what I will do is I will distract the Confederates in Louisiana. I'll get them thinking that we're going up to Alex and up to Shreveport. Great. Then, with the Confederates defending Shreveport, he'll tell his army in Louisiana, put on the brakes, dig in, and I'm going to go take Brownsville. And then I'll have a blocking force to oppose French interest in the lower Rio Grande Valley. And I will have planted the flag in Texas in the most meaningful way. I mean, the French will be able to look across the river and say, hmm, oh, 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 the are here. <laughs> so that's not good. Phase three is he'll leave that blocking force at Brownsville and he'll continue to draw troops from Louisiana over to the Texas coast and then he'll go scooting right up the Texas coast until he captures Houston. Great plan. But he also says, we're probably going to need some reinforcements to pull this off. And I know Chickamauga was bad, but certainly there's some troops that you can pull out of New York or New England to support this. He's being optimistic. So, now we get into the tangles of Louisiana. So this is going to be the feint. This is the bluff. This is the block. The real goal here is Texas. So this is a corridor of swamp. It's the Chapelai Basin. If you go from Houston to Baton Rouge, the highway across that sounds pretty much like this. Chung chung. Chung chung. Chung chung. Because you're going over the world's longest bridge. And those are all the expansion joints you're driving across. Chung chung. All right, there's only two ways to cross this, two uh, ferries, Morgan's Ferry, Lyons Ferry. So those become very strategic points in this campaign. The other corridor that I've mentioned before is up Bayou Tech. The two critical points here are Morgan City and New Iberia. New Iberia is the terminal of the road that goes to Houston. So once you turn left at New Iberia, you've got the coastal plains all the way to Houston. You've got a couple rivers to cross, but it pretty much looks flat all the way to Buckets. Okay? <laughs> and so you can just truck it on west 
And if you can just keep the Confederates guessing, they'll have to defend both Alex up here and Houston over here. So you can actually split the Confederates by getting them to guess which way you're ultimately going. So this is a great game of bluff. And those are the two key points now. Alex up here, make the Reds think they have to defend it, but really what you need to do is get to Vermilionville to cover any move west from New Iberia. Okay? Pretty complicated operation still. And you're trying to coordinate this up the Tash campaign uh, with troops operating against these two strategic ferries east of the shaft of life. <laughs> it's a nightmare. This is the breakdown of the armies. I won't tear you up with that, but essentially you've got an army east of the Shafalaya and an army coming up by Utesh, and you can see how the numbers are divided. You've got large depots at Port Hudson, Baton Rouge, and there's also a great deal of African-American participation with newly raised troops that are in on this campaign to supplement the numbers. Also a bunch of gunboats. Lots of gunboats going to operate in this expedition. So the idea is to go slowly and keep your ultimate plan quiet, keep the enemy's attention so that they don't know what you're really up to. All right? Y'all think about that as you're watching the highlights from the Ukraine show later on this evening. It's all about bluff and deception. Well, the Confederates aren't going for it. They would like to not be deceived. So they send Tom Green to go find out what the Federals are doing. And they decide to strike the Federal forces where they, they perceive them to be weakest, which is east of the Shaffer Line. And they attack them in a place called the Battle of Sterling's Plantation, uh, second bullet there. And they actually overrun an outpost and take a number of prisoners. And what they figure out is the guys east of the Shafalaya aren't really going to move towards Alexandria. They're really there to keep the Confederates off the West Bank of the Mississippi. This battlefield is still there right where they left it. It's very difficult to get to. But that's the uh, Battle of Starling's Plantation, one of Tom Green's more interesting fights. Actually took place in what I think is a Category 1 hurricane. Um, that's kind of an interesting thing I, I about settled on. The, the weather was so bad, in fact, it was really bad, that I think it might have been at least a tropical storm, if not a cap one. So that's the Battle of Sterling's Plantation here. And Green comes back and says, we don't have to worry about those guys east of there. They're not really the threat. The threat is down coming from Morgan City. And in fact, the threat from Morgan City is getting really threatened. The vanguard of the Union troop, the Union column coming up by Utesh, is the first Texas cavalry. Union. There is a Union regiment of Texas cavalry, including a number of troops from the Hill Country, that are leading the charge. And so you have a lot of Texas on Texas violence going on. Texans on the Confederate side, Texans on the Union side. And they uh, end up essentially developing a blood feud over there in South Louisiana. Pretty interesting Texas story. Uh, the cemetery just outside of uh, campus there in Kerrville has veterans that faced each other in these campaigns. You got dead Texas Unionists and dead Texas Reds right there in the same cemetery in Kerrville. But the Union troops finally get to New Iberia, the big jumping off point if they're going to turn left and head towards Texas. So it's so far successful. The Confederates in Louisiana are on the run. The Federals are threatening the Chapalaya and on the Red River. They're still threatening Alexandria. The Confederates haven't any idea what the Federals are up to. Is this an attempt to take Alexandria? Are they going to move to Texas? Doesn't look like they're moving to Texas. Somebody tell us what they're doing so that we can make plans accordingly. 
Well, here's what the real plan is. Here's how you plant the flag in Texas and how you overrun it. Two routes. The one that the Lincoln administration wanted the Federal Army to do is this goofy move up the Red River to Shreveport. The reason they wanted that route is because you could keep it supplied by steamboat. But when you get to Shreveport, then as now, you're in Shreveport. <laughs> you know, that's not planting a flag in Texas. Now you can press on the tire, which is San Angelo with trees. But, you know, that's not really brushing back the fringe. So Banks is going, I don't know what those, I don't know what map they're using up there in DC, but my plan's better. So we can get to Texas two different ways. Overland from New Iberia or we can go down here and move up the coast as I mentioned earlier. But you got to keep the Rebs guessing. So the Federals continue to push like they're going against Alexandria. You can see from this map there's a number of skirmishes. All of these skirmishes were fought and led by Tom Green. These are his big cavalry fights between Opelousas and Vermilionville, which is present-day Lafayette. So if you're going down, I, I guess it's I-49, um, you're going through all sorts of Civil War battlefields between Lafayette and Washington, Opelousas, and all the way to Alexandria, actually. Meanwhile, plans for the Texas coast progress. First guys that get pulled off the job in Louisiana and just kind of disappear are the first Texas cattlemen. Union. Why is Banks sending those guys to Texas? To rally other unions. Part and parcel of union war planning is that secession is not the will of the people. And that there's people just waiting to join the union cause if you can convince them that you're there to help. So we'll take these Texas unionists, reinsert them in Texas. The other troops that get pulled off the job are all those guys <coughs> east of the Chapelier. Once Green hit them, came back and said they're not a, a big threat, the Federals confirmed that by withdrawing them down to New Orleans to feed the invasion of Texas. It's under a new commander. The commander of the uh, Union troops in uh, east of the Chapelier is a guy by the name of Heron. He gets sick. He's replaced by Napoleon Dana. Uh, Napoleon Dana is the guy that will lead the expedition into, into Texas. All right. So November 2nd through 6th, you have a Union operation right across the SpaceX launch pad that captures Brownsville. And that's literally where this expedition is going on, down there at Boca Chica. So it's always something going on down in South Texas. Uh, they capture Brownsville and when the Union troops arrived at Brownsville, the pro Juarez forces in that part of Mexico overthrow the pro-French forces in Matamoros. So it's already having a very hopeful effect in terms of the overall uh, global political situation. Here's a, a nice lithograph of the landing down at Boca Chica, but I would point out that these troops are all part of what they called the Corps d'Afrique. These are all Afri African American troops raised in the summer of 1863 from essentially people pulled off of plantations in South Louisiana. So the guys digging that ditch there were probably just a few months before working on plantations in St. Landry Parish or St. Mary's Parish, uh, Louisiana. That's how emancipation happened. Once that landing occurs on the Texas coast, the Union forces in Louisiana can now slowly fall back. Well, this is going to tell the Confederates, wait, it wasn't Alexandria after all. But where is it? And then all of a sudden, the writer shows up and says, guess what? Brownsville's now got Union troops in it. Ah, so it's Texas. So does that mean that these troops here in Louisiana are going to go to Texas, or do we still have to keep an eye on them? Tricky business, war. 
So Tom Green lashes out and he goes and picks off some more Union troops to figure out what they're up to. Picks off another brigade near Opelousas, Battle of Bayou Bourbeau, and he comes back and tells his chief, I've got no idea. They're still here. They may go to Texas. They may not. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know if we should leave our Confederate Army here to guard Alexandria or if we should run to Texas to guard Texas. Don't know what to take. The bluff is working splendidly. Here's a map of the Battle of Bayou Bourbeau in case you want to take the metal detector, but the people there are armed and they probably won't like it. Uh, but this is Sunset, Louisiana is over here. Opelousas is up this road. Lafayette's down this direction. Karen Crow, uh, is, there's Landry Seafood in Karen Crow, so you've probably seen it off the side of the road as you're going down I-49. But that's the battlefield of Bayou Bourbeau, another Texas battlefield y'all probably not heard of. So when Banks is now putting troops into Texas, he rightly figures out that Matagorda Bay is the key. Because Matagorda Bay juts into Texas. And if you can get to Victoria, then you can get to San Antonio. If you can get to San Antonio, you might actually have troops moving in from the west. There's Union troops that have captured Fort Lancaster by this point on the Pecos that might come in from the west to throw in on this. So it's Banks is going to look, we take Matagorda Bay, we can go up to Houston, we can go over to San Antonio, we can do any number of things. That is the key to Texas. So he goes in to capture it. The Confederates have defended it or fortified it. They have a very curiously named fortification here, Fort Esperanza. For those of you who understand Spanish, Fort Hope. That does not instill a lot of confidence. We hope we can hold this fort. You know, it's a strange name for a fort, but I'm starting to figure out that the Texans aren't really into this right now. They're kind of going, how do we get out of this nightmare called the Civil War about this time? So that's what the uh, barrier islands of Texas look like. That's a tough walk in the sand for Banks' troops moving up the Texas coast. Matagorda Island goes all the way up essentially from Corpus Christi towards Matagorda Bay. This is what's there now. If you look at Matagorda, the entrance to Matagorda Bay from space, a couple of hurricanes have rearranged things. So it's not exactly some place you can go and tour now unless you have a light draft boat. You might as well put a line in the water while you're going, catch some redfish. But this is the key to Texas, this sort of beat up looking torture piece of sand. While Banks is heading north on the coast, favor fortunes the Union. The French are getting sucked into a guerrilla war in Mexico. Things are not going well. And their advance towards the Rio Grande has not only been blunted by the arrival of Union troops, but Mexican insurgents are really putting the habeas chompers on them. I thought I'd show you how smart I was by quoting Latin. <laughs> ah, they're getting beat up. All right, here's the order for the Union troops in Louisiana. Abuse and confuse the enemy. Okay, well, he's done it. Confederate troops spot a pontoon bridge. Wait, they're going to go left from New Iberia, they're going to cross those rivers, and they're going to move into Texas. Then all of a sudden, there's less Union troops in Louisiana. Where'd they go? Clearly put on boats, sent to Texas. So now, it's, is Texas going to be invaded by land or by sea? Well, it looks like it's going to be invaded by sea, but they can't be sure. So you can't reinforce the situation in Texas until you clarify the situation in Louisiana. That was pretty wild. But then they come up with an idea. Wait. If they're all going to Texas, who's on the Mississippi? And the answer to that is, well, nobody. So they said, well, let's go find out. And they cross over those two ferries I mentioned, find that the Federals are gone. So they set up cannons and start shelling boats going up and down the Mississippi. 
says, you know what we'll do is we'll draw them back from Texas by showing them that they've lost the Mississippi again. Doesn't work as well as they had hoped. They also pressed the Union forces around New Iberia. Number of skirmishes there. And ultimately, they figure out, okay, the Federals are calling it quits in Louisiana. Their main effort is in Texas. We ought to make the arrangements finally. Now, this is in December. Tom Green gets a message from the commanders in Texas. Hey, you guys are all Texans. Would you mind bringing the Texas troops back to Texas to defend Texas from the Federals? Except for the Federal Texans, and they need to be beat up too. <laughs> And Green says, look, you can't ask me. I've got a boss. You better ask my boss. So he tells his boss this is what they want to do. And his boss says, yeah, Richard Taylor, Confederate uh, general that's in charge of these operations, say, yeah, go back to Texas. So Green and the Texas Cavalry leaves Louisiana for the Texas coast. It's looking like things are going to go exactly like Banks wanted. He takes Matagorda Bay. He's concentrating his army on the Texas coast. His generals on the coast are saying, look, we can be in Houston by Christmas. We're going to get there. This is going to be so slick. But something happened. Ulysses Grant got over his horse wreck and gets pulled into action to save the army of Chattanooga and then gets asked if he'll lead all Union forces coast to coast. And Grant says, absolutely. The first thing we need to do is quit screwing around in Texas. <laughs> and when the word gets to Dana over on the Texas coast, he says, you know, you got to throw it away. I've got Houston in my sights. I can do this. We can win this. Come on, man. Coach, put me in. <laughs> Instead of being told, get your guys out of Texas. Nobody wants Texas. Nobody needs Texas. And everybody's going, well, what about the French? Well, funny you should mention that. <laughs> While they were looking, the French have had a very high-level meeting with the U.S. government saying, hey, guys, Tell you what, if y'all don't mess with our little escapades, we won't mess with your escapades. You know that big French ironclad frigate? Man, we're going to keep it down in Veracruz. Heck, we may even send it back to the Mediterranean. So don't mess with us. We won't mess with you. Everybody can be friends. That's why the Lincoln administration agrees with Grant. Get everybody out of Texas. So Banks is going, well, how am I supposed to achieve all these impossible things you asked me to achieve? And they tell him to talk to William Tecumseh Sherman. And Sherman says, I'll tell you exactly how to deal with the Trans-Mississippi. You don't have to kill them all. You don't have to capture them all. You don't even have to wipe them all out or spend any effort doing it. Just burn the place down. That's what he did going to Meridian in Mississippi. Just burn it down. He says, what you need to do is just burn the good part of Louisiana down. That's exactly what sets up the campaigns of 1864. A lot of people have heard of the Red River Campaign. That's one of the big red letter events in the Trans-Mississippi Civil War. Usually Louisiana's participation in the Civil War starts at the fall of New Orleans and ends with the Red River Campaign, and clearly nothing happens in between. <laughs> I can tell you that it's not correct. So he is essentially told by the Lincoln administration, go to Shreveport like we told you. But when you get to Shreveport, just start burning everything down and fall back and make Louisiana essentially completely untenable where it cannot support any enemy armies, wipe out the insurgency, just wreck the place. Now, if you know anything about William Tecumseh Sherman, he does this not only in the Meridian Campaign, but in Georgia and the Carolinas. That's kind of his M.O. So Banks is told, get on with it and never say the word Texas again. Okay, now we don't even need to plant a flag there. So now the Union troops are falling back from Texas, back to Louisiana, and the Confederates go, wait, 
We thought we were about to have to have a big battle for Houston, and now we look over there, and nobody's there. Where have they gone? Ah, they're back in Louisiana. So all the Texas troops that have gone to Texas are now turning around and going back to Louisiana. And then what happens after that is the Red River Campaign, which uh, I was visiting with my friend Curtis Milborn, who's one of the leading experts on Tom Green and the, these campaigns as well. You know, it's a campaign nobody wanted, nobody cared about, and it was a big place of time and money and energy and blood, but it happens anyway. I'm not really selling the next book very well, am I? <laughs> Ignore the last book because it's dumb. Okay. But all of this stuff is going on over at Kerrville. Come see me if you're down in the Hill Country. I'd be happy to host you. Uh, these are the books that I mentioned on this topic. That's the Louisiana Quadrille. You probably noticed some of the art that I used in the slideshow. It's actually art that I commissioned for these book covers. And I'll leave this up there in case anybody wants a signed copy of these books. I can put them in your hand. Just send me an email and I'll be happy to send it your direction. As they say in every other business except for higher education, leave them with the product. <laughs> well, we do have time for some questions. If anybody has any questions, I'm sure Dr. Frazier will be happy to answer those for a few minutes. Yeah, that's right. That was a complicated campaign, but y'all hung tough with me. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, what is your opinion on military reconstruction in Texas? What do you think was it? Success, failure, what are your thoughts? Reconstruction in general, I'm, I don't think pulled off its objective. There's a number of things about Reconstruction which set up further tragedies. For starters, one of the things that happens during the course of the war is the Lincoln administration weaponizes the emancipated population of the South. Now, from a visceral standpoint, it's like, yeah, payback time. You know, I saw the movie Glory, right? But what this does is it fosters generations of animosity. So military reconstruction is starting with a very bitter consequence um, and a bitter vibe that just ends up giving everybody something to hate, okay? So it unifies the opposition even if it's the defeated opposition. Again, watch the news. You'll see this exact same process going on elsewhere. So military reconstruction in Texas, well, reconstruction in general, but especially in, in, including Texas, is all about the old power structure trying to reassert itself. And it's, in many ways, reconstruction in Texas the Civil War creates modern Texas. And here's why I make that statement. Texas emerged from the war intact. In fact, it was a net importer of enslaved African Americans during the course of the war. 200,000 slaves in Texas in 1861. There's 300,000 slaves in Texas in 1865. And the Emancipation Proclamation only frees them if the Union Army can get there and free them. So we've got this interesting element there. You've got people moving there from Tennessee, from Louisiana, from South Carolina, Georgia, places that have been burned down. And they're bringing with them an entire suite of grudges. And what they end up doing is creating in Texas or embedding in Texas this sort of mindset that doesn't trust authority. I don't know if you've run across that in any of your comings and goings. Uh, there's a reason that we have a part-time legislator. There's a reason we elect judges. My wife's family's from Massachusetts. I, he comes down, cousin comes down and says, wait a second, you elect judges? Well, yeah, that way they're responsible to the people. He's like, that's a terrible idea. That's how you get grafting corruption in there. Well, says you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we like government that governs least. And that, I would say, is a, uh, an aftershock of the American Civil War. People moving to Texas makes it a booming place. And population goes up, expansion goes up. Texas is too big to police. 
with the troops that they send. There's some reconstruction violence in Brenham, Hillsboro, places like that. But ultimately, the old power structures reassert themselves just in a new context. And so Texas is, in many ways, got a Confederate attitude. And then you have to think, well, what did they do with that slave thing? Well, they kind of oppress civil rights, <laughs> you know? It's part of it. That we want everybody back in the box that they came out of. And then when you start having populations move in after the uh, Mexican Revolution kicks off in the 20th century, they just apply the same rules to that. And so race relations get really complicated in Texas as aftershocks of all this stuff. You know, there's only two Confederate capitals that aren't captured, Tallahassee and Austin, okay? So Texas comes out of the Civil War smelling like a rose. And Reconstruction lays lightly upon it. So, sir, if the French had been able to officially ally themselves with the Confederacy, would that have given the Confederacy a big enough boost to at least curb unpopular policies like conscription in Confederate towns? Um, had they had the French thrown in with the Confederacy, <laughs> we would be at the University of Saint Pierre now. <laughs> uh, and we'd all be speaking French because the French were going to annex it. Um, Even with distractions in Mexico? Say again? Even with distractions in Mexico? Yeah, because if they had, if, it's assuming if they had thrown in on the Confederacy that they'd handled their business in Mexico. Had they won the Cinco de Mayo fight, their timetable would have been such that they could have annexed or thrown a military protectorate over the Trans-Mississippi at the exact moment the Confederates need it. And all you have to do is sail the Normandy and its associated vessels over against the Union West, West Gulf blockading fleet and they just smashed it. There wasn't anything equivalent to these French warships, especially the Normandy. So uh, it would have, you know, all test is always fun, but long and short of it is, Scrappy little Tejano from Gonzaga, from a, a Goliad, upended their plans. That's a bit of money. Sir. I was curious about um, uh, Tom Green. Sure. Uh, do you know, if, did he actually survive the war or did he? He did not. Oh, okay. So the Red River campaign, that campaign that nobody wanted, that you know, it shouldn't have been fought, Blah, blah, blah. He gets involved in that. And in one particular engagement, gets a little too close to a Union gunboat. And Union gunboat fires grape shot, piece of grape shot around, you know, about that big. Hits him right here at the hairline. Takes off the top of his skull. He clinches up, spurs his horse, spins him around. Anything up here gets slung out all over his staff. It's gruesome. So the namesake of our county here meets a bad end in the American Civil War. What's interesting to me about Tom Green is that he is a, he is the Texans Texan. You know, there was people talking about running Tom Green for governor during the course of the war. So there was a lot of people that looked to him as an opinion leader, an influencer, if you will. And a lot of people thought that Tom Green was kind of the quintessential guy, which is a terrible burden to have to show him. You know, if everybody's looking to you to take a leadership role, how do you dodge that responsibility? Some of his contemporaries, like Jack Hayes, Texas Ranger during the U.S.-Mexican War, fought Indians, etc., he solved it by moving to California and essentially becoming somewhat anonymous. He escaped his Texas reputation by moving to California. Tom Green never got out from underneath that shadow of being a man of action on behalf of all of Texas's causes. And so, given that, Tom Green almost has to die in action. You know, it's funny, uh, my major professor at TCU was a guy named Grady McWinney. Grady McWinney ended up having Alzheimer's. And I could watch him deteriorate. He also had some strokes. And so he was on blood thinners, but blood thinners meant that, you know, it might exacerbate something. If he falls, he might bleed out. But if he doesn't do the blood thinners, he may have a heart attack. So, Doc, 
said, come on, you got to tell me. Give me some instructions. Do you want to die by bleeding out? Or do you want to die from a heart attack? So I'll know how to do your meds. And he goes, frankly, Don, I would prefer to fall at the head of my regiment. <laughs> the only thing he was missing, of course, was a regiment. <laughs> but I think that in many ways, uh, people like Tom Green, people like um, the people that were all in on the cause, were trying to figure out, how do I get out of this with my name intact? You know, Robert E. Lee tries to lead troops in the thick of battle twice. And when I tell Brooks, well, I think he kind of wanted, you know, death by police officer. They all go, not Robert E. Lee. Old guy with a heart condition, man. He can see things are going bad. Why wouldn't he think, what's the best way to go out? At the head of my regiment. I think Tom Green was thinking that. I think Alfred McConnell thinks that. There's a reason these guys ride into the guns on their horses, making a big target of themselves. And Tom Green's no exception. Takes that round through the head, and that's it. And his uh, eulogy, I mean, he dies, and he is eulogized in the loftiest terms. It's hagiography is what it is. And so, you know, everybody here is destined for the same. The best we can hope for is to go out on our terms with people saying good things about us after, after we're gone. So... Interesting guy, Tom Green. I think we have time for one more question. Over here? Me? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned at the start of the lecture that if the Confederacy were to be reincorporated, that they that slavery would still be around. Would the federal government not just say, no, slavery is now abolished and we claim it because you left? But they hadn't abolished it. Because remember, the rule book is the Constitution. And what had happened was there was a scaffolding of laws all the way up to 1861 that said slavery is a state prerogative down south, below this line. Tenth Amendment says we reserve certain rights. There is no congressional act, there's no laws. The only thing that the federal government can do to restrict slavery is wherever the federal government has jurisdiction, which is on the high seas or in the territories. So already they had said, we're just going to ban slave traffic on the high seas. Well, the number one market for slaves is going to be Texas and Louisiana. Number one supplier of slaves is going to be South Carolina and Virginia. So how do you get them from there to the Gulf Coast? You put them on boats. That's the cheapest way to transport them. And all of a sudden, now that's not going to be an option. You're going to have to take them overly, which is a difficult trip on everybody. The territories, that's why the territories is such a big issue leading up to the American Civil War, because that's federal jurisdiction. And so, uh, now I think that slavery was so thoroughly damaged that it would be tough to reconstitute. I think arming emancipated slaves, newly freed men, arming them was a cynical move on the part of the federal government. Throwing these guys in as cannon fodder. But once these men have been armed, they're not just going to go whistling back to the plantation saying, oh, great, now I can be a slave again. They will have struck for their freedom. And that conversation never quite gets worked out to anybody's satisfaction. So part of what you have to do to dis disable and destroy slavery is you have to inject it with venom that will work through its system and kill it from within, hmm. even if the Confederacy collapses and these states are readmitted with slavery intact, or even if the Confederacy won. They're going to have a slave insurrection to be banned. You know, you think about it, and people say, well, it wasn't all about slavery, huh? If it wasn't all about slavery, then why didn't the Confederacy militarize its slaves? Yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll emancipate you in, in exchange for your service. No, they would rather not be independent with their slaves intact. And the only thing I can make sense out of that is because they had this ace up their sleeve 
that slavery would still be intact even if the Confederacy collapsed. That's why the 13th Amendment is so critical. Complicated stuff. You asked a very simple question, and I poured the whole load on it. <laughs> Thank y'all for coming. Thank you so much. I have one commercial to make. No, actually, two commercials. This is a lectureship that the Department of History here is trying to get launched. The best way to get a lectureship established is to get it funded. The way you get it funded is you find support from the community. If you want to see a Lone Star Texas related topic ever marked on this campus, talk to your pals, talk to your friends out in the community. Doesn't take a whole lot to fund something like this. Uh, so it's doable. It's an achievable goal, and it's your way of striking for Texas. So I encourage y'all to do that. Second editorial commercial. I'm raising money down at the Texas Center to get this thing up and running. One of the things that I've been doing is trying to get any level of support from every Texas county, all 254. Doesn't have to be much. But I want to be able to go into larger donors and say, look, the Texas Center isn't just in Kerrville, it's all across the state. When I look at my map of counties that have thrown in, Tom Green County is remarkably absent. So, I'm not talking about much, I'm talking about, you know, a couple of empty lattes. That's all I'm talking about. So if you're thinking about something you'd like to do in terms of charitable support, I would like to put Tom Green County on my map but absolutely support this lectureship and help the history department figure out a way to build a financial scaffolding where this goes on in perpetuity. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for coming.